Welcome everyone to this, the first in our Open University Contemporary Cultures of Writing seminar series, Climate Change and Creativity, which is hosted in conjunction with the Institute of English Studies. My name is Ed Hogan and I'm a lecturer in creative writing at the OU. And my job this evening is just to look after the online housekeeping before passing you over to our real host, Sally O'Reilly. So first things first, because we've got so many people here, we'll keep everyone's microphones muted for now. There'll be a question and answer session at the end after the speakers have finished. So if you pop any questions for that in the chat box, we'll ask the question to the presenter. So just before the speakers begin, I ask you to switch your videos off. And if you go to the top right corner, you can change to speaker view for the best experience. So the first part of the meeting is being recorded, but please rest assured that only the presentations will be available to view afterwards, uh, not the Q&A. And we've got captions that you, can that you can access at the bottom of the screen. So that's it for me. Thanks for bearing with me. And now over to our host, novelist and senior lecturer in creative writing, Dr. Sally O'Reilly. Go ahead, Sally. Um, hi, thanks, Ed. Um, yes, as Ed just said, welcome to the first seminar in our autumn series. Um, in these sem seminars tonight and the next one, which happens on October the 5th, we will be hearing from a number of writers, activists and academics who are addressing their imagination to the unimaginable, the destruction of the planet. As we approach the UN Climate Change Conference, COP26, attention is focusing with more intensity than usual on this issue. But there's still a sense, to my mind at least, that the wake-up call has yet to rouse us from our collective torpor. Why this is, I don't know. Perhaps the reality is too terrifying to contemplate, so we keep focusing our attention elsewhere. Scientists have been pumping out unignorable statistics for decades, but we have ignored them pretty much. It's business as usual, as sea levels are set to rise, wildfires rage across the world, and vast tracts of the planet are predicted to become too hot for humans to inhabit. It's easy to go through life with blunt senses, semi-aware of what really matters. So perhaps, just perhaps, the storytellers and poets have a part to play now with words that can make you catch your breath. Perhaps there is a role for the literary activists among, among us in the struggle to raise the alarm. This evening, we're going to hear from three such writers. Sarah Butler has three novels published by Picador, 10 Things I've Learned About Love, Before the Fire, and Jack and Bat. Her short fiction and poetry has been published in anthologies by Picador, Root, Tyndall Street Press, and Pen and Ink Press, and journals including Butcher's Dog and Bear Fiction. She runs writing workshops in a variety of settings, including schools, parks, libraries, and museums. In 2007, Sarah established the literature consultancy Urban Words, through which she explores the relationship between writing and place through prose, poetry, and collaborative projects. Zoe Brigley is an assistant professor at the Ohio State University and is editor at Poetry Wales. She has three PBS recommended Blood Axe poetry collections, most recently Hands and Skull 2019. She published a collection of nonfiction essays on Wales and America, Notes from Swing State, Parthian 2019, and edited the Routledge volume Feminism, Literature and Rape Narratives, 2010. She is editor with Christian Evans of the anthology 100 Poems to Save the Earth, published by Seren earlier this year, uh, of which we will be hearing more shortly. Christian Evans is a poet, editor and environmental activist. His work explores receptions of the more than human through ecological philosophy and the history of magic. Recent publications include 100 Poems to Save the Earth and Other Worlds, published by Broken Sleep. He lives in Kenfig, Wales. In the introduction to their collection, Zoe and Christian stress that in this time of unprecedented crisis, poetry calls us to stay awake, 
to find the words to describe how it feels, to sing to what hurts, to reach out, to attend more closely and with more care, to see all things as our kin. As one reviewer put it, this anthology speaks the message we all need to hear. We must do more than just notice nature to save it in ourselves. But noticing is a good first step. So um, Zoe and Christian, if you'd like to, uh, to start, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. We're really excited to be talking about the book today. Um, I'm just going to share my screen and I'm going to take us through um, this talk today about our new anthology, 100 Poems to Save the Earth, which I have here and I have on the slide in a moment. Um, we're going to include readings from the book and a discussion of how intense moments of experience distilled in poetry offer us stories that might help us to act in a time of climate crisis. So we pose the title 100 Poems to Save the Earth provocatively, not to make any grand claims, but to emphasize that the earth is on the brink of catastrophic change and it could not be more important for writers and poets to address this startling fact. It's our way of banging the table. Alongside 100 Poems to Save the Earth, we've also published a chapbook of essays and letters that we wrote to each other during the editing process, exploring ideas um, and the, the ways in which we found poems, the, the ideas that we were thinking about and how we were approaching, thinking about the environment and uh, the ethics, the social ethics of being with other people as well. You'll see quotations from these letters interspersed on slides throughout this presentation. Um, yeah, thanks Zoe. You'll also see photographs um, that, um, that I've taken in Canfrig Dunes, which is a national nature reserve in South Wales, where I live, um, a site of special scientific interest, uh, well known for its uh, really quite astonishing biodiversity. That's, um, it's inspired a lot of our ecological thinking. It's also a place of climate change. What's now vast wild area of dunes and marshland home to otters and dragonflies and marsh harriers and rare orchids was once a thriving medieval settlement, a big town with cobbled roads and a castle that was abandoned because of the shifting dunes, uh, slowly encroaching on the streets and shops and homes, and the ruins of the town are now lost under the dunes. We want to begin with the suggestion in relation to climate crisis that storytelling could not be more important. If you trace the origins of the word story back through Latin and Greek, you'll finally come to the word histor, meaning wise man. And isn't that part of telling stories to try out different scenarios, to be warned of mistakes? And poetry, of course, is all the more intense as it represents distilled moments of experience. One thing we thought about a great deal in editing this anthology is what stories might galvanize us at a time of climate crisis. The reader might well ask, how can poems save the earth? Certainly not by marching in step with political campaigns, diverting poetry's meander into propaganda's mill, no matter how worthwhile the cause might seem. What is Earth, after all, isn't it our shared ground beyond all claim of border and boundary? A ground we share not only with fellow humans, but with those who are more than human. We might follow the lead of indigenous traditions and cultures and ask of the insects, birds, mammals, rivers, mountains, bushfires, ocean currents. Are they persons too? As William Blake puts it, the tree which moves some to tears of joy is in the eyes of others only a green thing that stands in the way. Our crisis is fundamentally a crisis of perception where one person sees the earth as an inert heap of resources to be exploited. Another will see a living web of connections and relationships, the complexity of which 
is often beyond our ability to understand. Blake concludes, to the eyes of the man of imagination, nature is imagination itself. Too often, it seems, the earth is a mirror in which we find only ourselves. But what else is out there? Can we find the words to describe it, to share it, to share with it? Are we really paying attention to mass extinctions occurring right now? And if creatures can be persons as much as human beings, as indigenous cultures have believed for many, many thousands of years, it seems, it's worrying then how easy it is these days for us to dehumanize each other. Perhaps because so much of our interaction and conduct is mediated by the internet. And often we fail to really notice the world and each other until it's too late. What about gentleness, care, openness, listening? And let's just intervene at that moment in time. And I'm going to read a poem by Carrietta called Carna Blue, which is very much about paying attention, about gentleness, care, openness, and listening in relation to a particular type of butterfly. And it's, ex it's actually explained in the epigraph um, by Nabokov that it was named by Nabokov. He says uh, it was based on a place called Karna, where in some pine barrens on lupins, a little blue butterfly I, ha I have described and named ought to be out. Karna blue. Because it used to be more populous in Illinois, because its wingspan is an inch, because it requires blue lupin, because to become blue, it has to ingest the leaves of a blue plant, because its scientific name, Lycides melissa samuelis, is mellifluous, because the female is not only blue, but blue and orange and silver and black, because its beauty galvanizes collectors, because Nabokov named it, because its collection is criminal, because it lives in black oak savannas and pine barrens, because it once produced landlocked seas, because it has declined 90% in 15 years, because it is. We live in a time of unprecedented crisis then, of mass extinction, accumulations of alarming data and terrifying predictions, increasingly, People are suffering from eco-anxiety and eco-grief as the bleak enormity of our situation sinks in. It often seems easier and better to close our eyes, to sleep and forget. There are a million ingenious distractions just to click away, waiting to deliver a lullaby. As, as Sally mentioned in her introduction, poetry calls us to stay awake, to find the words to describe how it feels, to sing to what hurts, to reach out, to attend more closely and with more care to each other and to our fellow species, to see all things as our kin. Yeah, and here's another quotation from a poem in the, in the anthology by Roger Robinson, A Portable Paradise, which is full of a sense of trying to preserve what's beautiful, what fills us with wonder, which for him is a kind of paradise. Empty your paradise onto a desk, your white sands, green hills, and fresh fish. Shine the lamp on it, like the fresh hope. So many, many of the poems in this anthology uh, implicitly and explicitly question what nature means, what the earth is, what our relations are, and what they may yet become. Old certainties have been rapidly eroded by new circumstances, but the poems absorb the changes. We compost the waste, redraw the maps, and full of trust, keep going. In thinking of these kinds of stories, let us look at another quotation from the anthology from a poem called Late Prayer by Canadian indigenous poet, poet Erin Robinson, who says, let our joy repeated be power that spreads. May our wealth be common. May oligarchs come out of their fortresses and become psychologically well. 
May their wealth be returned to the people and the places. May we shift, slide, rise, tilt, roll and twist. And something else that's important for this anthology is thinking about stories that recognize the violence against people and violence against nature, which is something that indigenous poets have been doing very well for a long time. And when we talk about poetry, we mean all poetry. In finding poems for this anthology, we've tried to move away from a traditional view of nature poetry or environmental writing, especially where it sidelines particular groups such as people of the global majority, LGBTQ plus poets or writers with disabilities. And often um, quite a few of the voices who are gathered in this anthology are speaking in terms of eco-justice, noting the connections between the exploitation of the environment and inequalities experienced by groups allowed fewer privileges. Seven of the poets included are indigenous poets from the US, Canada and Australia, which seems fitting as indigenous movements are often leading the way in thinking about campaigning regarding climate crisis. But I'm going to read a poem now, another one from the anthology, which is a really interesting one because it speaks to um, the experiences of women and connects that to a kind of experience of nature. Um, it's by Melissa Studdard, who's an American poet from Texas and it's called To Be With Trees. I dreamed of trees with blue veins in a forest full of wilting, and there all my southern girl self, full of no thank yous, full of you first, and go ahead and have the last piece of cake. I want that last piece of cake, dreamed the trees made me my own tort and I could have the whole thing. My sisters, the trees, they said, come now, sit, eat. They had blue veins in the forest full of wilting and I cried. There were no forks. They said my hands were fork enough. When I tried to say please, the trees said my eyes were please. And they said my mouth was thank you. And the trees cried too. They had beautiful eyes for crying, a color I had never seen. So I named it. God loves your eyes because he made them this beautiful color. Now, anyone who ever saw the color would think of the trees and the meaning of the trees, which was to be. And something that holds a lot of the stories together in this anthology is wonder. And even as we're trying to gauge and process the extent of climate crisis, don't we need those stories of wonder too? Stories that remind us how wonderful the world is, why it's worth fighting for, why it's worth preserving, why no matter if destruction is inevitable or not, it's worth our efforts. Whenever I think of wonder, I'm always reminded of the, of the quote by the biologist J.B.S. Haldane, uh, who suggested that the universe is not only queerer than we suppose, it is queerer than we can suppose. It's a fact uh, that many creatures perceive things that humans don't or can't. The world itself is actually more than human. There are things out there we just can't perceive. It's easy to forget that we are actually very limited by our senses and our cultural biases. The unknown, the unknowable even, is always there on the other side of everything. And let's end with a note of wonder and beauty and an image of stepping out of crisis from an American poet, Carl Phillips, um, about Monomoy, which is an island off the coast of Cape Cod. And this is what he says. I once watched a horse make her way back to land mid hurricane, having ridden surfer like the very waves that at any moment could have overwhelmed her in their crash to shore. She shook herself, looked back once on the water's restlessness, history's always restless, and the horse stepped free.
Thank you both very much for that um, really fascinating presentation. We'll take questions, as Ed mentioned, at, at the end after hearing from Sarah as well. So thank you both for that. Um, Sarah, would you like to? Thank you. Start? Very interesting. That was beautiful. Thank you. I'm already, I would have to stop myself from getting distracted and ordering the book. So I'm looking forward to reading <laughs> it. Yeah. Um, so my name's Sarah Butler. I'm a novelist um, and I have a kind of accompanying practice in participatory place specific writing. And I'm here in no way as an expert on fighting climate change, but to, I guess to revisit a project um, and a commission that I did um, quite a long time ago now in 2014, um, and to kind of reflect on that in relation to now and the future. Um, yeah. So it's a kind of personal story rather than a kind of sweeping kind of um, what's the word I'm looking for? Manifesto. It's more, yeah, a reflection on my own experience and my own kind of journey as a writer. Um, so I'm going to talk this evening about a commission I was ordered in 2014, um, which came out of a conference called Weatherfronts, organised by Tipping Point and Free Word in London. And the conference was, was really genuinely inspiring and motivating. And I arrived thinking that writing about climate change was just too big, too scary. And left thinking that not only was it possible, it was also urgently important. And so I applied for and was awarded a Weatherfronts Commission, um, which I'm going to re revisit and reflect on today and share a bit of the work with you. So out of all the ideas, connections and questions that arose for me over the course of this conference, um, two themes in particular snagged in my brain. The first was uncertainty and the second was scale. And I wanted to address these themes in my commission and also nod to the experience I had stepping out from from a windowless lecture hall, a free word into a rainy London evening. Umbrella-less, unprepared, I hurried to the train station, thinking about how we as humans think and talk about the weather, and in particular rain, an interest fueled perhaps by recent return to the markedly rainy city of Manchester, where I grew up, um, and I'm still based. So I proposed to create a multi-voiced prose narrative, using rain as a lens to build a layered exploration of how people engage with uncertainty across a range of scales. I decided to begin with a participatory research process, initiating on and offline conversations with a range of people, including children, architects, um, atmospheric scientists and forecasters, to explore the science of rain, the mythology surrounding rain, the relationship between climate change and rain, how rain impacts on our individual lives and psyches, and how uncertainty and scale operation in operate in relation to rain. And concepts of collaboration, community, transparency and communication arose again and again in conversations at that conference. And in that spirit, which also chimes with my own participatory writing practice, I blogged creative responses to my research over the period of the commission. Um, I also attended a session at that conference which centred on scientific modelling and uncertainty. And I was really interested in this kind of difference between the scientific understanding and use of the word uncertainty and that of the media or lay person. And I was also struck by the pressure people place on modelling scientists to provide concrete answers when that is exactly what they cannot do. It's kind of larger scale version of watching the weather forecast. And uncertainty in how we deal with it is a rich theme and a pertinent one in relation to our approach and reaction to climate change as individuals and communities. So my second theme, scale, was also mentioned throughout the conference, particularly this kind of thorny question of how we can relate to the huge global scale of climate change, how can we can relate that scale to the smaller everyday scales we operate on as individuals. Like uncertainty, it speaks to my own issues with climate change, too big to think about, too big surely to be affected by little me deciding not to fly or to recycle more or to insulate my loft. Scale is so interesting in relation to fiction. In my own work, I tend to fo focus on the minutiae, someone's choice of shoes, the way they look at a woman on the bus, the undercurrents of what is not being said. I see significance and nuance in the small choices we make. I'm interested in and passionate about politics and global issues, but when I write about them, I do so on a small scale through individual human stories. So one of the scientists at the conference was also talking about um, scientific modeling as forcing a structure onto something in order to understand the world, which correlates interestingly for me with the process of writing. So I wanted to think about what uncertainty means on a narrative level without completely frustrating a reader um, and also play with the idea of an end. Might we have more than one ending or no ending at all? So my approach then was to find a couple of ideas and images to use as anchors, to create a methodology I could follow, and then allow myself the freedom to see what would happen. And so I went about it. I met with two scientists at the Centre for Atmospheric Science. It's very long, so 
very long um, centre, Centre for Atmospheric Science, School of Earth, Atmospheric and Environmental Sciences at the University of Manchester, who very patiently explain their research on clouds, rain and forecasting. I spoke to children, architects, cyclists, teachers about their experience of rain. I set up a blog where I posted creative responses to my conversations and email exchanges. And at the same time, I spoke to friends and family about their perspective on climate change, read scientific papers and blog posts and attended a couple of climate change focused events in Manchester, where I live. And maybe that was one of the most interesting things about this um, commission was that it, it actively started. I actively started to engage in conversations with the people I knew about what was going on and how I was trying to understand it. Um, and represent it. So I'm just going to share um, just a couple of pieces from the blog. If I can work this out. Um, oops, just briefly. Okay, so this first one um, is called An Architect Talks About Rain. It was from a conversation um, with the architect David Ogunweer, Um, And I, I basically simply just extracted um, parts of um, the conversation and rearranged them into this piece. So we are talking about shelter, the preconditions for settlement. We must avoid water penetration. This business spawns a language of skins and pores, membranes and openings. Water wants to get inside. Deluges are one thing, but then there's the moisture that's left behind and how we get rid of it. Gravity, symphonic, a 184. Have I told you about capillary action? How sheens of water cling to the micropores of a wall, track back up into a building's nooks and crannies. We must avoid water penetration. We must let a building breathe. Um, so this next piece was inspired by me looking very bemusedly at pages of computer code from an atmospheric model um, kindly sent to me by um, Chris at the University of Manchester. Um, and I chose this extract, which you can see right at the bottom of the screen to kind of um, respond to. Um, so, if you are already cold, then think twice before spending your days in hypothetical clouds. If you are already fragile, then be careful who you touch. Sure, you've a raincoat and a pair of gloves and get out there. And if. So, this is just kind of me trying to have find some ways of sort of thinking around science and um, language, I guess. Um, this is a very short one. So um, Miles, who was eight at the time, talked about what's rubbish about rain. I don't like rain. There's no taste to it. It ruins Halloween. It gets in my cello case and wet break is the worst. Um, so, oops, um, so then I sat down to write um, my commission, which I called Amber Warning. And it was just as difficult as I thought it would be. Everything I wrote felt too heavy with symbolism. I found myself worrying about whether I was writing about climate change enough or too much. And it was a real struggle to quiet, to quieten this critical, anxious voice enough to be able to write freely and creatively. I'd originally anticipated writing one story with interweaving voices, but what came to me were four quite separate stories, which I decided to think of as a sequence. I scoured weather forecasts online and picked out the un or certain phrases used to articulate what might happen in the future expected, possible, likely, with perhaps the risk. I used these phrases and the idea of a weather forecast to link the sequences of stories together. The stories themselves came from a range of prompts, an email from a 12-year-old girl, a meeting with two climate scientists, a foggy walk in the Lake District, and a conversation with a climate change activist. They all, I hope, give a different perspective on how we as humans deal with uncertainty on a global and a personal scale. So I'm just going to read a short section from one of the stories before I end, um, which is called Some Heavy Bursts of Rain Possible. And it's about um, it's two sisters, Rosie and Hannah. Hannah's husband has just left, left her. She lives in Australia. Rosie lives in the UK. Rosie thought about her bank account. She had a couple of thousand saved and three weeks leave still unplanned for. She closed her eyes and tried to imagine herself walking through Heathrow. Fluorescent lights and polished floors, glistening shop fronts, digital departure boards. But she'd made a promise. She'd said she wouldn't. I miss you, she whispered into the receiver. She heard Hannah sniff and swallow and pictured her sister nodding with her face scrunched tight. Rosie had made the decision years ago. Too much information, she joked to Hannah at the time. Once you know what all those emissions are doing, you can't just ignore it. That was before Ian. Before Hannah had sat at Rosie's narrow dining table, toying with a glass of wine, and said she was moving to Australia. 
Rosie had laughed because it seemed impossible, ridiculous, unfair. I'll come back and visit, Hannah had said. We'll see each other. It's like everything's fallen away, Hannah said. Her voice sounded distant. All those plans we had for Billy, for the house, for us. We're supposed to be going on on holiday next month, Jamaica, it's all booked. She paused, maybe you could. Rosie held her breath, maybe she could. It had been easy enough the first few years when Rosie had hardly enough money for rent, never mind flights to Melbourne. Hannah did come back once a year and each time it was like they'd never been apart. These days it was more complicated. Rosie had a good job, money in the bank and no commitments. Hannah had a family, an extension, marriage problems. No, of course, Hannah said, I'm sorry, Rosie, I just... Rosie dug her fingernails into the hard brown hallway carpet. She wanted to tell Hannah that she dreamt of her as you might dream of a dead person, howling dreams full of grief that left her wrung out, the sense of loss clawing at her insides. The rain was coming down harder now, hammering at the house, the wind rattling the windows and the letterbox. It had been John who'd started it. All those books and websites about carbon emissions and drought in sub-Saharan Africa, climate change workshops and late night discussions and Rosie's rising sense that this was real and important and that she had no choice but to do something. They promised each other they'd never fly again. It was almost as though they were getting engaged, a giddy sense of power and commitment. And then John had gone, the way all of Rosie's men seemed to, but climate change wasn't going anywhere. And so she kept her promise, even when Hannah moved to Melbourne, even when Billy was born. And Hannah said she understood. Rosie watched the rain shooting against the windows, listened to the wind trying to break into the hallway. Do you remember that time you wanted to get a tattoo, she said. What? You wanted a tattoo on your shoulder. Hannah let out a quiet huff of a laugh. Every end is a new beginning. Wise before my time, is that what you're saying? I was going to have the same one. And we chickened out at the last minute because mum would have thrashed us into next week. I was glad, Rosie said. I was scared of it hurting. Me too. Rosie cradled the plastic receiver in both hands and listened to the coming storm. She wished they had had the tattoos, black cursive letters along the line of their shoulder blades, two mirror images on either side of the world. I'm just going to stop sharing that. Um, so just to end my, my ambition implying, no, no, my ambition in applying for this tipping point Weatherfront's commission was that this would somehow act as a tipping point in my own work that I would discover a way to write about climate change and that this would inform my work from that point on. In honest truth, that hasn't happened for a whole host of reasons, including a PhD and having two small children. Having finished the PhD and started to emerge from my baby fog, I find myself turning again to this question of how do we engage with the climate, change, to the, with the climate crisis as writers and as individuals? What role does writing have to play in this ever more urgent situation? I don't have an answer. I still struggle with the idea of setting out to write the climate crisis. I'm still unsure how or to what extent I want to explore the future in my fiction, which very much focuses on the past. Revisiting this commission, though, brings me back to my instinct to think thematically. So my focus on uncertainty, scale and rain, to explore ways to create and explore multiple voices, to work collaboratively, to try to find ways to engage with the huge and complex issue of the climate crisis in ways that dovetail with the stories I'm driven to tell and chime with the type of writer that I am. And to try and take the pressure off a bit, to find ways to tell these stories sideways, to avoid the weight of them somehow, whilst also imparting what feels important for us to pay, to pay attention to. I've also been thinking about time and scale, how a novel, for me anyway, can take three, four, five, six, ten years to write, And there is, of course, no guarantee of either publication or audience. And so I've been thinking that perhaps it isn't in my novels that I do this work, or at least not just there. Maybe it's in collaborative participatory projects, which for me so far have generally focused on particular places and communities. Maybe this is the space where I can do something that feels positive and useful, where I can create new work through conversation and collaboration, which has an immediate audience and a shorter, more responsive timescale. I'm still thinking about all of this, and as many would say, now is the time to act, not think. Um, So I'm really grateful for this panel and the other events in this series, which I know will help me develop that thinking further and inspire me to take action. Thank you for listening.